Welcome, Honorable Mayor, City of Montebello, Mayor David Torres, for the welcoming remarks. Good morning. I'm Mayor David Torres. To my community members, it's great to be with you here this morning. To our visitors, welcome to Bicknell Park and the City of Montebello. I'm proud to be present with you today to continue the solemn tradition of remembrance and solidarity of one of the most evil acts of violence in human history. It does not matter, and it will never matter how much time has passed. We will always remember what happened when over one and a half million people were systematically tortured and murdered on death marches, in concentration camps, and across the Ottoman Empire. Not only will we remember, but we'll make sure that the world never forgets. We'll make sure that everyone calls it by what it is. Actions so imaginably horrible that we call it a crime against all of humanity. And yet grounds laid by tragedy are fertile places for seeds of hope and inspiration. Our Armenian community and this monument have been a source of inspiration for me during my four years in office. I think about a council in the 1960s who persevered through international pressures to erect this monument of remembrance and strength. My heritage as a resident of Montebello and by their actions are speaking truth to power, standing for what's right against incredible odds, and a global perspective because what affects my brothers and sisters overseas affects me here at home too. My colleagues on council, past and present, have continued this tradition. I was proud to put forward a resolution unanimously approved by the council stating that the city of Montebello recognizes the autonomy and independence of the Republic of Artsakh. I was proud to sign a letter authored by my colleague, Councilmember Salvador Melendez, condemning the blockade of Spankert by Azerbaijan. And I'd also like to share that the City Council has come together to commit funds in support of the Spankert Sister City Association in the upcoming budget. Celebrating those international ties and relations and our community's connection to Armenia is a priority and a commitment by the City Council. Last but not least, I'd like to thank and recognize our Assembly members, our Senators, and Representatives for their tireless work in acknowledging the Armenian Genocide in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. This monument quietly reflects on the past, but if you listen closely, it speaks to us every day. It tells us to be strong when national and world events are terrifying or confusing. It teaches us to have compassion and care for each other. And it reminds us what can happen when we let intolerance fester. What else does this monument say? To the events of today and tomorrow, this monument says has, have courage. And it says the Armenian people will always have a home away from home in the city of Montebello. I'd like to thank the United Armenian Council of Los Angeles for the invitation to join with you this morning. And thank you to our representatives, senators, and assembly members again uh, for all the work that you do on behalf of our community. It is well noted, and we are so grateful for your efforts. Thank you very much. And of course, as you may know, she continues to push for the U.S. administration to respond immediately and harshly and effectively to the situation around Lachen Corridor, emphasizing the need for much stronger measures against Azerbaijan, and as you may also know, she has been to Armenia and to Artsakh, so please let us welcome her. Hello, I'm Congress Member Judy Chu from the San Gabriel Valley, which includes the nation's oldest Armenian-American community in Pasadena. I am honored to join with Armenians here in Los Angeles and around the world 
to commemorate the lives of the more than 1.5 million victims of the Armenian Genocide. This genocide at the hands of the Ottoman Empire was carried out through executions, forced marches, starvation, and other atrocities. It is a historical fact. Even America's own ambassador at the time, Henry Morgenthau, recorded what he called the murder of a nation. Of course, there are those who want to erase history and deny reality by claiming this genocide never happened, brushing it aside, or whitewashing it as just the price of war. But I knew we had to fight for its recognition. I knew because of people like my constituent, Joseph Bibo Manjikian. When I met him a few years ago, Bibo was 104 years young. And from his wheelchair, he told me about the immense cruelty of the Ottoman Empire and the many family members he lost in the genocide. It is because of people like Bebo that for years I co-sponsored the House resolution to recognize the Armenian Genocide. But it seemed like there were so many obstacles. And then, finally, there was that historic day in 2019 when we voted in Congress on the House floor to officially acknowledge the genocide. Mm -hmm. Bebo had passed away by then, but he was in my mind as I looked up in the gallery and saw dozens of Armenian Americans with tears in their eyes watching the vote that we thought would never happen. But today, we also need to stand up for <clears throat> Armenia and Artsakh so that history cannot repeat itself. I am proud to be one of the only members of Congress to visit both Armenia and Artsakh and I saw for myself that the Armenian people were alive and thriving in Artsakh. But I must tell you that before I made the trip, I was visited in my office by Azerbaijan officials. They warned me not to go and said that if I ever visited Artsakh, there would be consequences. So when I returned, they banned me from ever setting foot in Azerbaijan. But I consider this a badge of honor. And in fact, it only strengthened my resolve to advocate for the people of Armenia and Artsakh in Congress. And that's why I am a proud member of the Armenian Caucus where I serve with the amazing leader, Congress member Adam Schiff. That's why I am an original co-sponsor of House Resolution 108, the resolution to condemn Azerbaijan's blockade of the Armenians of Artsakh and to condemn its ongoing human rights violations, including Azerbaijan's illegal blockade of the Lakin Corridor, the only connection between Armenia and Artsakh, which deprives the Artsakh people of food, energy, and medication. And that's why I've signed on to this year's appropriations letter asking for assistance to Armenia and Artsakh, and also to direct the State Department to secure the release of pris prisoners of war held by Azerbaijan, and to prohibit any U.S. financial assistance to Azerbaijan until they stop this terrible aggression. And that's why I signed on to a letter to President Biden urging him to take action on this issue, including the imposition of sanctions on Azerbaijan. We must do everything possible to stand by the people of Armenia and Artsakh as they struggle for their right to self-determination in their own land. Today, I wonder what Bibo Manjikian would think of this moment. I think he would be so relieved that we have finally gotten U.S. recognition of the genocide. But I think he would also say, keep on fighting for the people of Armenia and especially the people of Artsakh who are being deprived of food and medicine as we speak. And keep educating people about the Armenian Genocide, so that all Americans understand the truth and reality of what happened. That is why I am proud to once again be an original co-sponsor of the Armenian Genocide Education Act, which directs the Library of Congress to develop curricula for schools across the country to teach about the Armenian 
genocide. And that is why I believe it is so important for all of us to be here at commemorations like this so that we can ensure the Armenian genocide never happens again. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, Congressman Adam Schiff, who doesn't need a huge introduction because you know him very well. To be quite honest, I feel like I could say that about all of our speakers today um, because they've been so involved in our community. But I will give you a little introduction nonetheless. Congressman Schiff has been serving as a U.S. representative for California since 2001. Currently, he represents California's 30th district running for Senate. Congressman Schiff led his fellow co-chairs of the Congressional Caucus on Armenian Issues and the 24 members of Congress in sending a letter to the President, President Biden urging the administration to use diplomatic tools to ensure the safety of the people in Artsakh amid obviously this growing crisis in the region, also calling for the administration to seize all financial support and for sanctions to be imposed. Congressman Schiff. Good morning, uh, and, and thank you for that uh, beautiful introduction. It's an honor to be with you and to join my colleagues. And uh, as you know, I am proud to represent the largest Armenian community outside of Armenia. And on my trips to Armenia and Artsakh over the years, I've reminded the Armenian prime ministers that no one uh, besides them represents more Armenians. And if I don't like the job they're doing, I may just go over there and run against them. Uh, but it is a... Uh, it is a pleasure uh, and an honor um, to join you today uh, to commemorate uh, this uh, solemn occasion. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And I want to acknowledge uh, Judy and thank you for all of your efforts uh, to recognize the genocide and your leadership. Uh, my great Senator uh, Anthony Portentino, thank you for being here. And I see Adrian Nazarian and Michael Fear as well, uh, and other elected <laughs> officials that have come to. Uh, pay their respects to those that were lost during the genocide. 108 years ago, the Ottoman Empire began a systematic effort to destroy the Armenian people. Teachers, writers, business people, doctors were rounded up and killed. Clergy were tortured and burned alive in churches. Infants were ripped from their mother's arms, and children died gasping for a drop of water. Many Armenians were killed outright, and others, including Gomidas Vartabed, considered the father of Armenian music, suffered such emotional trauma after witnessing the sheer magnitude of the horror of the, massac of the massacres. Despite the overwhelming evidence of this methodical mass killing, Turkey has long engaged in a campaign of denial of genocide and to silence those who would speak the truth. But for the United States, we will no longer be silenced. In 2019, for the first time in history, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the resolution I've been carrying for more than 20 years, finally recognizing the Armenian Genocide by a near-unanimous and bipartisan vote. The, Senate, the U.S. Senate likewise passed a resolution affirming the facts of the Armenian Genocide, and in 2021, President Joe Biden finally cast aside decades of shameful silence by our country to become the first sitting U.S. President to officially recognize the Armenian Genocide. These, these historic achievements happened because of a resilient and enduring Armenian diaspora, and it is an unwavering testament to the efforts of thousands of activists and organizations, communities, and church leaders. It's a victory for human rights and for truth itself and it's something that we achieved together. But we know there is so much more work for us to do, and our thoughts and our hearts today are with Armenia and Artsakh, because the Armenian people are still under duress and under attack, and have, have suffered such terrible losses, including those who died in Artsakh, the thousands who were forced to flee from the unprovoked aggression by Azerbaijan and Turkey, and those who remain prisoners of war. Azerbaijan's unprovoked attacks on sovereign Armenian territory and the brutal blockade of Artsakh risk another genocide. We have seen this before, and we must not allow it 
to happen again. These are the horrific consequences when aggression and hatred grow unchecked and when Aliyev's hostility is met with silence, only emboldening him to continue and expand his unprovoked attacks on the Armenian people. This is why Azerbaijan believes it can annihilate Armenians in their historic homeland because too much of the international community remains silent. We cannot allow violence and crimes against humanity to go unanswered. Whether they occurred 108 years ago or as recently as this year, this month, or this week. The United States must impose sanctions on Azerbaijan and U.S. support for the warmongers in Baku must stop. The United States must continue to pressure Aliyev to immediately reopen the Lachin Corridor, direct U.S. humanitarian assistance to Artsakh, call for the safe and unconditional release of the remaining Armenian prisoners of war and captured civilians, hold Azerbaijan accountable for the destruction of religious and cultural sites, and support democracy in Armenia and a free and independent Artsakh. On this solemn anniversary, as we pause to remember the victims of the Armenian Genocide, we reflect on the resilience of those who survived and the perseverance of their children and their grandchildren who built new lives in the United States, speak the beautiful Armenian language, and enrich our nation with Armenian culture and heritage. Despite the trials the Armenian people have faced and continue to face, it has not broken their faith determination or will to survive. The Armenian community has survived the harshest of trials and tribulations, and yet it remains strong and unbowed here in Los Angeles, in Yerevan, in Artsakh, and around the world. And I want to let you know that I will always stand with you. Thank you. those uh, supportive words. We are very lucky to have you represent us. All right, uh, now we do have a bit of our, um, we have our keynote speaker right now. Uh, it is an honor to call Karnik Kerkorian. Kerkorian. Um, you hear me okay, right? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. See, just, I'm used to hearing my voice loudly for better or worse. All right, our keynote speaker, Karnik Kerkonyan, a distinguished international lawyer, legal work uh, forces on suits involving foreign entities in US courts. He's a recent recipient of, an, of a number of prestigious honors and awards, including most recently the ANCA Western Region's 2022 Champion of International Justice Award and the 2021 Distinguished Armenian Lawyer Award of the Human Rights Defender of the Republic of Armenia. If you're familiar with his work, he does so much for Armenia and Artsakh. Uh, in addition to his day job, um, it really is an honor to welcome him to the stage. And if I were to list everything he has done, we would be far behind schedule, and we already are. So please welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you, Araxia, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the UACLA for the warm invitation to speak here today. Hokevod Haider, distinguished guests, Sireli Haider Nagitsnev. Some of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be difficult to hear. Some of it may be difficult to digest. Some of it may be difficult even to believe. But if there's one thing that I can assure each of you, it is that everything we are going to discuss today is true. It's painfully true. It's disgustingly true. This is unquestionably one of the most dire moments in recent Armenian history. A moment of existential threat, of torment, of trauma, of injustice and indignity. It's a moment that delivers us back to a collective memory of unresolved injustice and at the same time pushes us forward into an ominous uncertainty. The depravity is cemented. It's cemented in my mind and it's cemented in many of your minds too. 
I am absolutely certain of it. The images of an old Armenian man struggling on his back in the grass and weeds as his head is being sawed off with a serrated edged military dagger. Armenian captives crawling on their hands and knees being prodded like animals by Azerbaijani soldiers with metal pipes. A stamp issued by an actual government depicting an exterminator in a hazmat suit cleansing Nagorno-Karabakh of Armenians. A military trophy park in Baku showcasing the helmets of fallen Armenian soldiers, gruesome and bloody mannequins of Armenians displayed in a public park for Azerbaijani children to mock and degrade. The president of a state in this century, a century after the genocide, referring to Armenians, to many of us, as dogs. This is not never again. This is not never again at all. Armenian POWs bound and brought to their knees and Azerbaijani soldiers in sickened euphoria unloading bullet after bullet after bullet into the heads and backs of young Armenian boys, teenagers, boys barely in their 20s. Then actually circulating a video on social media? What is that? A grotesque victory lap? And it doesn't stop. Her body was mutilated, Turkish words chiseled into her bare chest, her eyes gouged out, stones jammed into her eye sockets in their place, her fingers chopped off and shoved into her mouth. A young Armenian mother, not much older than many of you here. Coexistence? Coexistence and integration? as a solution to the Artsakh question? It shocks me when policy makers and think tanks in Europe and even in Washington and frighteningly even in Yerevan suggest that the best outcome for Nagorno-Karabakh would be some sort of protected status within Azerbaijan. Really? Placing Armenians under the control and authority of Azerbaijan right at the time when Genocide Watch has raised the genocide threat level facing Artsakh Armenians to levels 9 and 10, when the Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention has warned that Azerbaijan's actions, and I'm quoting here, are part of a larger genocidal pattern demonstrating Azerbaijan's armenophobia and genocidal intent aimed at the eradication of Armenia, Artsakh, and the Armenians. In this documented reality, the solution being pandered by sophisticated parties is actually placing Artsakh Armenians within Azerbaijan. That's a workable solution for the fate of actual human beings? Integration when 120,000 Armenians remain under total blockade by Azerbaijan now for more than four months? When Azerbaijan has orchestrated a pattern of measures unquestionably aimed at rendering living conditions unbearable for human beings, cutting off gas, severing electricity lines, blocking humanitarian aid, sabotaging internet connections, and its links to the outside world. Coexistence, where Azerbaijan is seeking to completely isolate and encircle Nagorno-Karabakh, that we even allow this narrative is appalling. We would never, ever imagine subjecting a population of 120,000 Jews to the authority of a rabid Nazi regime, or any Nazi regime for that matter. Let's give it another try? That would not only be utterly ridiculous, it is patently inhumane, intellectually vapid, morally bankrupt, and it's disgusting to even imagine. The same is true here. You know, there's a reason why Armenians have a natural aversion to the thought 
of subjecting Armenians to the authority of the Baku regime. Actually, there are a number of reasons. Sumgait, Kirovabad, Maraga, Nakhichevan. There's also Ramil Safarov. You may remember him. The Azerbaijani military officer participating in a NATO peace program in Hungary who broke into the dorm room of an Armenian soldier in the middle of the night and then hacked the young Armenian to death in his sleep with an axe before turning around to hunt his Armenian roommate. Ramil Safarov is not crazy. Ramil Safarov is cultivated. He's a fascist murderer specifically cultivated by the Baku regime. He is a celebrated hero today in Azerbaijan. Aliyev extradited him from Hungary, where he had been convicted of murder, welcomed him back to Baku with a bouquet of roses, and not only set him free, but awarded him medals, an apartment, and even back pay for his time incarcerated in Budapest. Let's not fool ourselves. We're facing an authoritarian dictatorship committed to destroying the Armenian people. And that's not hyperbole. Ilham Aliyev said it himself. We will destroy you, he told the Armenian Prime Minister. Just this past September, Aliyev announced the creation of the Goycha Zangezu Republic, a new republic spanning from Gyumri to Sunik in Armenia itself. The new country even opened a representative office in Ankara, with Erdogan's blessing, of course. And before you laugh it off as something silly, think about this. Azerbaijani soldiers carry maps of this new republic in their pockets. And Yerevan itself is on those maps. Unrealistic, you think? Just last week, Azerbaijani soldiers were wandering around Sunik, crowing about having executed and mutilated Armenian boys. And just in case we miss the connection, I'd like to remind you that just two years ago, the Turkish president stood next to Aliyev at a military uh, parade in Baku and openly praised Nuri Pasha, the Ottoman leader who executed the eastern flank of the Armenian genocide a century ago. The message is clear, at least to us, so what have we missed? How have we allowed this narrative of coexistence, this idea that Artsakh Armenians can somehow just be part of Azerbaijan as a minority with security guarantees? How have we allowed that to even be entertained by the West? How have we allowed the minority rights narrative to grab hold while the narrative of Artsakh self-determination has been neg uh, neglected as unrealistic or the talk of nationalists? How is it that Europe today can tell Armenia, and this is their words, to lower the bar on Artsakh and speak about the Artsakh Armenians from the perspective of minority rights, not as a people with the right to self-determination. How in the world did we get here? And it's not just about power politics. It's not simply might makes right. It's not simply Azerbaijani, the Azerbaijani lobby or caviar diplomacy. You know, we Armenians for more than a century and for far too long have consoled ourselves with the idea that things are beyond our power, that big powers dictate and, you know, we just must simply conform ourselves to the outcomes. That's a cop-out. It's intellectually lazy. Saying it's all about power politics is like saying that suffering a heart attack is just about genetics, that nothing else plays a role. We know that's not right. Brute force and power have their place, sure. But we know the international world order is a bit more complicated than that. The truth is that states set policies, define interests, and seek outcomes based on narratives, stories of how they want to see the world, stories of democracy, of free trade, development. You know the themes. There are also narratives that Western states fight against. Dictatorship, authoritarianism, fascism, hatred, discrimination. So the way we tell our story, the language we use to tell our story matters. And it turns out it matters a whole lot. How does our story fit 
within these prevailing narratives? How do we tell the story the right way? The stories we tell others, even the stories that we tell ourselves, shape the thinking of interest groups, think tanks and capitals, and they're part of the conversations at negotiation tables, and even in the kitchens and the living rooms of world leaders. How you tell the story matters, sometimes more than the story itself. And in the world order, in the games played by states in war and peace, international law is one of these storytelling tools. It is one of the ways that states set their narratives in this global world order. It's how states tell other states their stories of what the world should look like and what the world should not look like. And I don't believe that we're powerless in this game, not at all. We have a role in contributing to the development of these international legal narratives. It's our obligation to tell our story in a way that fits into the themes that states and their leaders actually care about. No one's going to do that for us. It's our job to tell our story the right way. So while we endure the atrocities of war crimes, the unending struggle of sovereignty and statehood, the painful trials of human rights, we must bring ourselves to peer out of this repulsive pit and try, if even for a moment, to tell our story, not in tears and resignation, but in the language that the world speaks when they speak about the international world order. And in doing so, we will see that the very concepts, the very legal principles that underpin our own existential uncertainties, our human rights struggles, and even the very atrocities that I just spoke of, those very legal principles are themselves in a state of monumental flux right now. The scope of war crimes and even the definition of genocide has expanded in our lifetimes. The idea of cultural genocide did not even exist a century ago when Armenian churches, cemeteries, and schools were being ransacked, looted, and desecrated. The term ethnic cleansing did not exist when my ancestors and those of others here were being driven from their homes and herded into the Syrian desert. Today it has a definition under international law. The systematic forced removal of ethnic, racial, religious, and religious groups from a given area. And along with direct removal, extermination, or deportation, ethnic cleansing even includes indirect methods. Methods aimed at forced migration, like rendering living conditions so severe, so austere, as to coerce a people to leave and not return. That should sound familiar, especially as Azerbaijan's total blockade of Artsakh enters its 132nd day. We must connect those dots. Nobody's going to do that for us. The concept of sovereignty itself has never been as fashionable as a subject as it is right now. Today, the principle of sovereignty underpins the discourse of military confrontation in Europe, the narratives of economic sanctions pitting East against West, the limits of cyber warfare, and the idea of sovereignty, the question of sovereignty, grips Armenia by the jugular. Even the principle of self-determination has literally transformed in our lifetimes. It's no longer the simple tool of decolonization. Within the last three decades alone, the United States, NATO, Russia, Europe, and Africa have all spoken and acted in its name, and at the most consequential times in their own histories. In fact, self-determination is how the number of states in the United Nations grew from 60 in 1950, to more than 190 today. Self-determination is not dead. Self-determination is an expanding right at international law, richer today than it has ever been before. And of course, it is one of the essential themes that will define one of the most uncertain and perilous corners of the Armenian experience today, Artsakh. So, how does our story actually fit in this constantly evolving legal framework? And what does a century-old genocide have to teach us in this regard? How do we tell the story of Artsakh, define the future of Artsakh, consistent with these legal narratives, the ones that matter? On the one hand, there are those fundamental facts. Artsakh was never part of any independent Azerbaijani state. Let's get that out of the way. 
During the Soviet period, the sovereign state was the Soviet Union, not the Azerbaijani SSR. Artsakh seceded from the Soviet Union, the sovereign state, consistent with the Soviet law on secession. Azerbaijan knows this law very well. It used the same law when declaring its own independence. But you see, Azerbaijan writes that story right out of the books. And the West, especially Europe, is all too eager to help it do it. It openly pressures Yerevan to accept Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan. Don't worry, it's telling Yerevan. We'll make sure that the Artsakh Armenians have security guarantees, perhaps even a protected status within Azerbaijan. This is a colossal sham. It's a false narrative. Europe is purposely turning the law of self-determination flat on its head in order to placate Azerbaijan. What Europe is doing is insulting. It is treacherous. And if this deceitful narrative is allowed to continue, humans will suffer the unspeakable. I want to explain this game because it's important. Self-determination today comes in two accepted variants. Internal self-determination, this idea that of a protected status within a state, and external self-determination, an independent status separate from the state. The rule as to whether internal or external self-determination applies has become established in the three decades since Artsakh's Declaration of Independence in 1991. The idea of internal self-determination is best exemplified by the case of Quebec. As many of you know, Quebec exercised the right of self-determination and sought to secede from Canada in the mid-1990s. Quebec wanted to be independent of Canada, noting its distinct French language, its culture, its linguistic differences, its religious and historical ties to France. It was culturally, linguistically, and historically unique, different than the rest of Canada. Quebec wanted independence. Now what's absolutely important to remember is that when Quebec exercised its right to self-determination, the Canadian army was not assembled at the gates of Montreal with weapons, tanks, and soldiers clamoring to exterminate the Quebecois or force them into the Atlantic. In fact, at no point during the Quebec secessionist movement did the Canadian government seek to exterminate the people of Quebec, to destroy their churches, scrape away the French language from the buildings to chase the Quebecois out of Quebec like dogs. Remember this. When the case reached the Canadian Supreme Court, the outcome was clear. Quebec did not have the right to secede from Canada. In other words, it did not have the right to external self-determination. The Canadian Supreme Court specifically held that the, need, that the need to protect Quebec's cultural, linguistic, and religious character could be realized through internal self-determination, a protected status within Canada. It reasoned, you know, Canada is a multi-ethnic state. The democratic and constitutional guarantees by Canada could encompass and protect these cultural and linguistic preferences. Internal self-determination in the Canadian context would not open the door to the ethnic cleansing or genocide of the Quebecois. The context here, of course, is profoundly different. Azerbaijan has already engaged and is actively engaged right now in the ethnic cleansing of the Artsakh Armenians. The blockade itself is proof of that campaign. The Azerbaijani president, parliamentarians, many prominent cultural figures openly espouse hatred Dehumanization, removal and extermination of the Artsakh Armenians. Armenophobia has been intentionally and strategically institutionalized in Azerbaijani society. The backstory is unavoidable too. Azerbaijan has already ethnically cleansed Armenians from every city that has fallen under its authority and control. There are no more Armenians in Baku, Sumgait, Kirovabad, Nakhichevan, and since 2020, there are none in Shushi or Hadrut either. And there's more. Azerbaijan even labors to cleanse the land itself of any evidence of Armenians. 
destroying Armenian churches, unearthing entire Armenian cemeteries, scraping away ancient Armenian biblical inscriptions, and claiming that the Armenian churches are actually Albanian churches. Just four months ago, the Azerbaijani ambassador actually told the United Nations Security Council that even the word Nagorno-Karabakh does not exist anymore. The Azerbaijani said the same thing, the Azerbaijani president, just a month ago. Imagine now, for a moment, a Canadian ambassador telling the United Nations Security Council that the word, word Quebec does not exist anymore. Justin Trudeau saying that the word Quebec does not exist. The Quebec model, this protected status within another state, may work in the Great White North, but it doesn't fit the facts here. Azerbaijan is not Canada. Azerbaijan right now is holding Artsakh Armenians, including women, children, the disabled, and the elderly, hostage in a total blockade that is targeting and starving actual human beings in complete isolation and utter darkness. What comes next has played out like clockwork, from the Armenian Genocide to the Holocaust, from the Rohingyas to Darfur, and from Cambodia to Kosovo. And this is where international law gets interesting. It turns out that in the face of ethnic cleansing and the risk of genocide, which is clearly what we have here, it is external self-determination that is legally required. This was not always the case, but the internet, but international law, like Jalal generally, is a constantly evolving body of norms. External self-determination in the face of ethnic cleansing or genocide is the Kosovo variant. It is what the West, led by the United States and NATO, demanded in the Kosovo crisis. That recognition of Kosovo's right to self-determination and the independence of Kosovo as outside Serbia was necessary to prevent ethnic cleansing and genocide. That case went to the International Court of Justice. The court rendered a decision which underpinned the recognition of Kosovo's independent statehood outside of Serbia. And the decision is quite revealing. The court actually identified what triggers external self-determination. The court held, and I'm going to quote it here, the international law of self-determination has developed in such a way as to create a right of independence for people subject to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation. The court recognized that when, when external self-determination is appropriate, when the people faces subjugation, domination, and exploitation. And this makes a lot of sense. A people when a people faces ethnic cleansing and genocide, the solution cannot be to push those people into the authority and control of the state seeking to exterminate them. That, that would be absurd. Fast forward to the blockade of that distant mountain road. There's no question that Artsakh Armenians stand before a cliff of death or displacement. Under international law, this is precisely where external self-determination is triggered. International law provides ex ex external self-determination as a final stopgap measure to prevent ethnic cleansing and genocide, to prevent math, mass death and displacement. External self-determination is the proper step here. Anything else is empty semantics uninformed naivete, or simply the green lighting of ethnic cleansing and the extermination of a people. Again, you know, while ancient and storied, the Armenian nation is a living nation. We are a living nation with stories yet to tell and epics yet to write. We must recognize, especially as we commemorate the genocide today, that Artsakh is the heart of that living nation. It's the place where Mesrop Mashtots, over 1,600 years ago, created our alphabet, and the place that 35 years ago sparked the Armenian independence movement itself. But most importantly, Artsakh is the place where 120,000 of our people, our Armenian people, stand on their native land 
against all odds, surrounded by Azerbaijani forces intent on their elimination. Artsakh is our story, and many of you know this story. It's the story of Van, it's the story of Musalir, it's the story of Armenian national dignity in the face of conquest and subjugation. Allowing the freefall collapse of the foundational pillar of the Armenian nation will have irreparable consequences. And I'm going to assure you that peace is not one of them. It will only embolden the fascist upstart in Baku, one who has thrived in a distracted world order, to finish the horrendous objective that every leading human rights organization from Amnesty International to the International Association of Genocide Scholars has red flagged as underway. Genocide is not simply what happened to us. It is what is happening to us now. Ethnic cleansing against the Armenian people is sport. It's been a sport for nearly two centuries. The genocide was simply its Super Bowl. And make no mistake, this is what impunity tastes like. As my colleague, Garo Ghazarian, said to me in Shushi during one of our many working trips there, narratives matter, stories matter. They are powerful and they change realities. Getting the self-determination story right paves the way towards genu genuine security and peace in a manner consistent with the ideals and principles upon which a law-based world order should be founded. Getting the self-determination story wrong only opens the door to abject subjugation, policies that will exacerbate the conflict inhumanely and quite literally lead human beings to their slaughter. There are no security guarantees and no protected status that can mask the lingering odor of genocide committed, that revolting smell of genocide left unpunished, and that sickening stench of genocide pounding and pushing at the gates. Artsakh is Kosovo, not Quebec. Understanding this and insisting upon this may be just enough and just in time to prevent another ungodly and gruesome chapter in our recent human history. Thank you. Um, I do have an acknowledgement to make. If Girard Sefilian could please stand. He is here from Armenia. He's visiting. Where is he? There he is. A round of applause, please, military commander of the 1st Artsakh War, Special Battalion, Sushi. Thank you for being here. All right, and now, thank you for your patience. We do have a few more speakers. Congresswoman Linda Sanchez. An honor to bring you up on stage. Congresswoman Sanchez represents California's 38th Congressional District. She was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives back in 2002. And she is the first Latina to serve on the powerful House Committee on, on Ways and Means and the House Judiciary Committee. Please come on stage. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by thanking the United Armenian Council of Los Angeles for hosting this event and for inviting me to participate as a speaker. We're gathered here today to remember the one and a half million Armenians who were cruelly and systematically murdered by the Ottoman Empire. Although this occurred over a century ago, generations of victims and their descendants continue to feel the effects of this genocide. Some of those survivors came together right here in the city of Montebello and founded one of the first Armenian communities in Southern California. So it's fitting that we assemble here today. They built this monument to remember the friends, family, loved ones, and neighbors that they lost. Today, it stands as a powerful testimony to the atrocities that were committed, reminding the world that we cannot allow hate, fear, and discrimination to prevail. It's been said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And one needs only to look right now at what is happening in Artsakh 
to feel the full weight of that word, those words. For nearly four months, Azerbaijan has blocked the only road connecting Artsakh with Armenia and the outside world, leaving hundreds of thousands of people without reliable access to food, to fuel, to medicine, and creating a humanitarian crisis. I have repeatedly called on the Biden administration to, ex to ensure that aid reaches the people of Artsakh, and I will continue to hold Azerbaijan accountable and call for an end to this blockade. You have my commitment that I will always stand up and speak up for the Armenian people. Together, let us keep fighting to protect human rights and to promote democracy around the globe. Thank you again so much for including me in your memorial. God bless. Yeah, we switched. Thank you. Our ne next speaker, California State Senator Bob Archuleta, representing the 32nd District, encompassing parts of southern eastern Los Angeles, as well as Orange County. Please welcome Senator Archuleta. Well, everyone, welcome. What a beautiful day. Today's Earth Day. Today is a day that we look and rejoice that we have such a beautiful environment and everyone is just here to just love this day. But all of us that are here today in Montebello are here for a different reason. We're here to acknowledge this terrible genocide that we've heard. And to our keynote speaker, thank you for your words. It was so inspiring and the history and the knowledge that has got to go across this nation is so, so important. I'm your state senator here in Montebello and, and I have the honor to work with our local elected officials and, and I have the honor to serve in the Montebello Police Department. And my history with the Armenian community goes back years upon years because I used to guard this monument because there was a word that something was going to happen. It was going to be, paint would be thrown on it, rocks would be thrown at it, people would come. And we said no in Montebello, we're going to protect it and we're going to make sure it's well protected. Well, over the years, as you know, more and more people have come each year to acknowledge what you all know in your history. Well, I'm going to give you one more that we're going to do together. And that is, as your state senator, I'm going to go before the state senate, and we're going to declare this as a uh, memorial, this mo beautiful memorial, as a historical memorial here in California. <laughs> I believe it is now time I will get the support from my assembly members that are here. I will get the support from the Congress members. I will get the support from the Senate. I will knock on doors. I will do whatever it takes. But this beautiful treasure that we have to acknowledge this terrible atrocity should never be down, should never come down. It should be here forever and ever. And we're going to do that together. So the Armenian Council, the Armenian brothers and sisters, all of us across this state are going to join together and do whatever it takes that this make this, to make this happen. So I pledge to you, with your help and participation, this will become a historical monument. What do you think of that? Thank you. And before I go, I would just like to point out to uh, our uh, school in Pico Rivera, where some of you have gone, and Father, I see you here, and God bless you, as always. So I will thank you all for coming. It is an important day today, but it's just a start. Things that are happening right now, we heard through the Armenian people, we've got to let this nation know. We've got to stand up and say enough is enough. We've got to change it. So let's start by making this a historical monument. I'm your Senator Bob Archuleta. Thank you. All right, now please put your hands together for State Senator Anthony Portentino, currently serving in the California State Senate, representing the 25th Senate District, which encompasses parts of the San Fernando Valley and San Gabriel Valley. Do I really need to say his dedication and commitment to the Armenian community is incomparable? Well, Adam Schiff sitting next to you. You guys can compete together. How about that? 
Uh, but Senator Portentino always has the trademark Armenian flag on his tie, so we've got to get <laughs> you one of those as well. Please welcome Senator Portentino. I'm the senator who couldn't step up steps. But I do want to give a big shout out to Congressman Adam Schiff. Let's make some noise for Adam. Because certainly President Biden would not have recognized the genocide without Adam's 20 years of making sure that that happened and all of you for working with him. So yes, congratulations Congressman, Sch Congressman Schiff for all of your leadership and your continued success. We wish you well. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, I, I don't, the, the keynote speaker, I, I don't know, and all of the speeches and all of the stories, it has been a really emotional morning. So thank you for letting me uh, be part of it. It's just an honor to commemorate the 108th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. And as my Senate colleague uh, from Montebello, we on Monday will pass Senate Resolution 28, which will reconfirm California's recognition of the Armenian Genocide. And we're both authors of that uh, resolution. And not only does it commemorate the genocide, but it also speaks to the atrocities of what Azerbaijan is doing in the Lashin Corridor, and that's important for all of us to speak out. I want to thank the United Armenian Council of Los Angeles for organizing the annual commemoration today. And we've heard stories, you've lived stories, your ancestors have lived stories, and every time I open up a history book and I read what went on, I just feel compelled to, to, to share more. And so. Uh, one passage uh, really struck me. It was a nightmare in Dalfour when a 12-year-old's family were warned of the proximity of the Ottoman soldiers. She fled with her money, mother and her 8-year-old brother to a hill above the village to hide their valuables and wait for the rest of their family to join them. But as dawn came, a massacre erupted. They watched as soldiers beheaded her father and stabbed her two-year-old nephew before turning on the boy's mother, who was seven months pregnant. The three of them returned to the village the following night to bury the dead. The scene was hellish. We put the killed baby on my sister's chest and covered them with stones. But we couldn't find my mother's corpse, wrote the woman, recounting the story told by her grandmother. When asked about his grandmother, a survivor said, my dreams cannot mourn her. They are deferred. I did not have enough energy to mourn her. Another survivor said, she didn't shed a tear when her family was slaughtered. And years later when she was asked why, she said, have you ever seen a stone cry? Have you ever seen a stone cry? These are just a few of the first-hand experiences which were published in The Guardian back in 2015. And many of them are similar to what's going on in Artsakh <coughs> and what Artsakhis are experiencing today since the 2020 war. 108 years later, the two successor states of the genocide, Turkey and Azerbaijan, continue their violent aggression against the Armenian people. Now while Armenia and Artsakh have tried to recover from the war, attacks on the border, violations of human rights have not stopped. Now I went to Artsakh since the 44-day war and I witnessed firsthand the destructive impact that that war had on a peaceful people. I met with wounded soldiers, I prayed at memorials, and sadly filled with weeping and mourning family members. It was an emotional experience beyond anything that I've ever experienced and it made me angry and sad. But it also makes me determined to speak up. This current illegal blockade of Artsakh, the imprisonment of Armenian POWs and civilians, the systematic destruction of the Armenian culture and religious sites in parts of Azerbaijan, the ongoing brutal campaign of ethnic cleansing against the Armenian and Artsakhi people, it's reprehensible. And so earlier this year we worked together to lead efforts to speak out and join Congressman Schiff and the other Congress members to speak out against Azerbaijan. We need to end all military aid to Azerbaijan. We need to end all military aid to <laughs> Azerbaijan. And instead, we need more humanitarian aid to help feed and close and house the people of Artsakh. Now it's critical that we move beyond these words and take action. The Lashin Quarter must be reopened and we must speak and demand that that happens.
Now, California is home to the largest Armenian community in the, in the country and have made significant contributions to the 25th State Senate District in our great state, and I'm honored to stand in solidarity. But I'm also sure and convinced and determined as ever that we have a moral obligation to condemn all genocides and violations of human rights. And if you think this is a past history, and I know some of the speakers have talked about it, just this week the Turkish Council was sending letters in Sacramento saying that genocide didn't happen and said we're being good neighbors to Artsakh. In the letter, shame. There's nothing neighborly about attacking a peaceful people and killing them. There's nothing neighborly about starving a peaceful people, trying to get them into submission. And if there's anything that we all know, and we all can agree on, there's nothing more resilient than the Armenian people. So thank you for letting me be here. God bless. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to say. These are opportunities for us to think what's happened in the past, and then call to action moving forward. So very briefly, I want to take a moment and say thank you to the United Armenian Council of Los Angeles that always works in putting together these events. I very much appreciate all the different individuals who we don't see, who are not standing up here, that work very hard to make sure that we are commemorating appropriately and educating in the process as well. One. Two, wanted to take a quick minute and thank our host and our mistress of the day, uh, Araxia. Thank you for everything you've done. You know, she's a bright star, she gets quite a bit of fame, but the reality is she may not really get as much applause and thank you and gratitude because everyone assumes that she might be getting those thank yous and applause anyway. So once in a while, it's very important to step up and say thank you for generating the issue of the Armenian Genocide, generating the issue of the Armenian public and constituency in Southern California to the level that she has through her media comp uh, uh, exposure. So with that, thank you. A couple of minutes ago, Scott Schmerlson was invited, uh, was introduced, and he's sitting right there. I want to take a quick minute and give a shout out to him because this is the man who's worked day in and day out very hard to make sure that the Armenian children in schools in LAUSD are recognized well. And so, based on his efforts also, I was inspired to introduce AB 1801 that allowed, that, which the gov Governor Newsom signed last year, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, that allowed not just students to stay home, on genocide day but for the school district to get paid by the state for the students who are missing the school that's the key component to this so there's a call to action item for this and i'm going to get to that in a minute uh last but not least you know a lot of political leaders uh come speak talk about their conviction uh to the issue to the justice restored of the Armenian community of what's happened to our loss uh, but I don't get to see too many union leaders coming up and sitting amidst us for the duration of the event so David president of SCIU 721 thank you for being here with us last but not least call to action uh, folks today marks the 108th commemoration of the Armenian Genocide. But today also marks the 133rd day of our brethren being blockaded. And you don't hear about it in anywhere, unless if it's Araxia talking about it, or a few other independent sources of news media. So I very much appreciate what Karnig just talked about. This is what impunity tastes like. Get a good dose of it. And let's go back tomorrow to reinvigorating ourselves to make sure the things that we need to get done are being done. 
when the governor signs 1801 into legislate into law we should get up and thank him and then make sure that we reach out to every school district and ask the school districts have you now taken formal resolution steps in order to make sure that students in your constituency can stay home and it shouldn't just be in los angeles or glendale or burbank those are given ones it should be in eureka it should be in stockton and it should be everywhere else in order to raise the profile of the issue so that more people become aware of what's going on and with this we need to gain our conti continually gain the support of our allies include Assyrians, Greeks, Jewish, Cambodian, and all others that are impacted that AB 1801 specifically includes. So today we say thank you. Today we say thank you for being here because we weren't really supposed to be here either. Let's not forget that. Tomorrow we resolve ourselves to continuing to do good work. Uh, we've had a lot of setbacks over the course of the last few years. Those setbacks should only embolden us to do more work. So with that, I just want to take a moment and also say thank you to Governor Newsom for the wonderful work that he's done in emboldening our community and in signing a bill like 1801 into law when there isn't a large Armenian caucus, by the way. Uh, made up of Armenian American members. There's a large caucus made up of our dear friends and allies, but in the state legislature of 120 members, there is not a single Armenian at this point. So it's extremely important for us to be very thankful for the work that's being done and continue to keep our eyes and monitor the situation for future opportunities. With that, someone who has helped pave the way for our community to have the political successes and for many young Armenian Americans to actually step up into political positions is a dear friend, mentor, and a trailblazer in our community, Paul Krikorian, that I have the privilege to not only call friend, but also, and for the first time in the history of our city, Council President Paul Krikorian. Thank you very much, Assemblymember Nazarian, and let's hope that you will not be the last Armenian-American member of the State Assembly. We need to get to work. Uh, so I want to thank very much uh, the organizers of today's event. Um, we're gathered here again in this sacred spot where we've gathered for 55 years um, on this spot to remember the horror of the Armenian Genocide. And I was thinking about it. I really can't say how many times I've given speeches here, how many times I've listened to speeches here about the Armenian Genocide. And almost every single one of them involved the reason that we have to remember the past is because if we don't remember the past, we're, con we're condemned to recommit it. I've heard it scores and scores and scores of times at this spot and elsewhere. And if there were any doubt about the truth of what we said then, all you have to do is look at where we are right now. And I'm so grateful to Baron Kerkonyan for so clearly and urgently describing the situation of this very moment because brothers and sisters make no mistake it is absolutely true that there has never been a time since the Armenian genocide when the Armenian people have faced a more serious threat from the racist hatred of those who wish to exterminate us from this earth than right now as we sit here with the clear echoes of the Armenian Genocide still resonating, Azeris are joyfully celebrating the murder and the mayhem that they're committing, the torture that they're committing against civilians 
today. On this very day, Azerbaijan continues to hold kidnapped Armenian civilians and prisoners of war as hostages in violation of every international law. And if that weren't enough, right now, the fascist dictator of that state is continuing to blockade 120,000 Armenians in Artsakh, trying to starve and freeze, the, freeze them into submission and surrender. Folks, if the lessons of recent history have taught us nothing else, they certainly should have taught us by now that when a fascist dictator encourages racism and threatens genocide, we should take them at their word because they mean what they say and it will come. So, to the our United States government, I ask, how many more Armenian children must starve before you act? How many more Armenians must be murdered in their beds before you act? How many families must worry about whether they will have energy, whether they will have food in Artsakh right now, whether they will be able to get their children to life-saving medical care where they can't because of Aliyev's brutal genocidal blockade? How many more must suffer before our government acts? I'm grateful that we have good friends in Washington, and some of them were here today uh, to speak, and, and have been every year, and I'm appreciative of people like Congressman Schiff and Congressman Sanchez and Congressman Chu for their leadership and their advocacy in Washington. But let's be clear, our government has failed us. Our government was founded on the principles that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these rights are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if we meant that when we founded this country, then let's apply those principles for the people of Artsakh who are being deprived right now of their life and their liberty and their ability to pursue happiness. Our government needs to act on those values. For years, as I mentioned, for years, we've stood on this spot, and I've stood on this spot, and I've spoken out, and we've demanded, and folks practically begged, for even the slightest scrap of justice and appropriate remembrance of the genocide, and we get lip service from our government. Lip service. Let me be as clear as I can about this. Every single statement, every single proclamation, every single resolution that's been passed recognizing the Armenian genocide of the 20th century is absolutely meaningless and empty words if it's not accompanied by real, tangible, effective action right now by our government and others to stop the Armenian genocide of the 21st century. So today, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't mean to let my frustration and my anger in any way impact the solemnity of what we do here as we remember the past. Today is a day of solemn remembrance, of course it is. But it has to, if it means anything to remember the past, this day has to also be a day when each one of us, Armenian and non-Armenians alike, recommit ourselves to protecting the people of Armenia and of Artsakh from ongoing racist aggression and to preventing genocide and crimes against humanity, against Armenians, and everywhere it occurs, everywhere in the world. We have to do this, of course. We have to do this for the people of Artsakh and for other victims of racist violence. But we have to do it also for the sake of our own souls. There was a prominent German Protestant 
during the genocide, uh, during World War I, who spoke out about his own government's non-response, his own the media of Germany's non-response to the atrocities that were being committed in partly in Germany's name against the Armenian people. And he reflected on the consequences of that and the consequences of impunity for those sorts of atrocities against humanity. And he said this, he wrote, it is impossible to appreciate what kind of impression the way in which society and the press are discussing the Armenian horrors will make on the generation of men who are growing up today. They are learning to worship an idol of opportunism and real politik, which if it becomes dominant, will cleanse away all noble dispositions. Now how true did that prove to be true within 20 years after he said that, when his own government committed the Holocaust? And how true is that sentiment even now when we don't pay attention, we don't take action, we allow, as Baron Kerkonian said, the, the false narrative that the powers of the world can do what they will and there's nothing we can do about it. Every time the world witness every time the world witnesses a recurrence of genocide without acting every time we avert our gaze to avoid thinking of the unthinkable every time a tyrant or a terrorist avoids accountability for unspeakable acts of barbarism and cruelty we all suffer a loss of some of our own humanity we become more calloused we become more immune to outrage and as we allow ourselves that personal luxury of looking the other way of choosing not to experience the searing pain that must accompany all such atrocities we do nothing but guarantee that the next atrocity is more likely to occur so today brothers and sisters we remember we remember to mourn those who perished we remember to honor those who survived and flourished but most important we remember for the sake of our own humanity. Thank you very much. Please welcome Assemblymember Miguel Santiago, who serves in the California State Assembly. He represents the 54th Assembly District, which encompasses parts of downtown LA, East Hollywood, Boyle Heights, Montebello, Commerce, and Vernon. He's also a member of the California Latino Legislative Caucus. Thank you. But what she forgot to say is one of the most important caucuses that I'm in is the Armenian Caucus. Well, I want to thank the United Armenian Council of Los Angeles for inviting me here. I have the pleasure now of representing the Montebello area and working with many of the communities out here. And one of the things that struck me about being able to represent Montebello very early on is the monument and what it means. And we reflect on, on the genocide. Something that has been horrible, that we wish would have never happened, but did. We reflect today on the blockade. Something that's horrible, but it happened. And, and I can't emphasize enough, you know, when I sat here and I'm listening to the words that pe people say, that it is absolutely correct. This is only lip service if it's not followed by strong action. That's what the council president said. And, and I, think, I think it's more true today than ever. Because it's one thing to write it down. And when we took a look at all the injustices in the world, we can tweet about it, we can do a resolution, we can do a proclamation. But if it's not followed by action, people still continue to suffer. If we don't fight for it, we continue to suffer. Two presidents have acknowledged it. Maybe one did using kind of fancy tiptoeing words. President that I love, but he didn't come out and say it. 721 and it's president. 
But we should have more. We should have more. And we should hold everyone accountable. The state of California should do all that is possible to make sure that that blockade ends, to make sure that there are, we had hoped when we're growing up and we read about Martin Luther King and we read about what happened in Nazi Germany that we would never see another atrocity. And here we are today seeing another atrocity. Thank you for inviting me here today. We hope to work towards ending the blockade, ending that we will never see another horrible chapter of humanity's history. Thank you. And our last speaker, as labor leader for SEIU 721, he did come out with a great amount of money. I want to say a huge thank you to the United Community Council. We have a saying that we're stronger together. And it's important to be here together in solidarity. So on behalf of our 95,000 union members, we offer our flowers today as a symbol of our solidarity. Here we have every day our union members on the job working to protect the health and well-being of our community. And our commitment to justice is unwavering. I would especially like to thank our Armenian American union members and very especially thank our Armenian caucus who's here today. If you'd stand up and be recognized, I'd appreciate it. We have a big round of applause for our Armenian caucus, SAU 71. These are union members who continually serve the people in our region with the utmost professionalism and dedication. Even though many of them worry about their family members and other parts of the world that are facing oppression, persecution, and even death. Re recently, we witnessed the emergence of threats against our Armenian brothers and sisters in Los Angeles County. Our message is clear. We will not tolerate ethnic or religious persecution at home or abroad. And the challenges we face are extraordinary but so is our determination. So once again, on behalf of the 95,000 SEIU 721 members, we're here with you every year, and we stand in solidarity with you every single day. Thank you so much. Thank you.